Um, before I uh, ask my questions, um, Ladies and gentlemen, this is a very heated argument between Donald Trump's latest MAGA border czar by the name of Tom Holman and this particular senator here. Uh, this is literally getting out of control here. But watch what happens. Since it has not yet been done, I, I, I think it's important to really make sure that the jingoistic, bigoted testimony of Mr. Holman is called out as nearly completely untrue as being an outrage, and as a former official directing the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency, he should know better. Uh, so, M Mr. making Chairman, sure that I am... Mr. Chairman. No, no, this is my five minutes. Well, the word, the word, the word, what what, what I, did I, I say was inaccurate? I, I, it's, uh, okay, not it's, asking a question. Okay, the, the general lady is recognized for five minutes. She's made her point, and I will try to resolve any other issues at the end of her questioning. Okay. Thank you. So, I, I just think it's important that it's not accepted as accurate testimony. Mr. Holman, is there a crisis on the border? Jim Jordan begins to press Mrs. Schultz. Watch. Of course. And has there been a crisis there for a long time? Yes. I just want to get, because your, your testimony was at the broader issue, and I, I, we, we, this is critically important, but we also have a broader issue there. We got unbelievable numbers we've seen on the border with apprehensions and everything else, right? Absolutely. If I can respond to the earlier remark from uh, Washington Schultz, I forgot more about this issue than you ever know. So if you say my testimony is inaccurate, it's wrong. Everything I said here is accurate. Bottom line, if you want to go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, I'm here. I'm here in my own time to speak to the American people about what's false I'm sure and what's happy back. to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with you, Mr. Holman. Well, I'm wow, wow. So Mr. Tom Holman, who was appointed by Donald Trump as the new border czar, is literally uh, preparing to take up Schultz threats to go toe to toe. Watch. I'm here. Any day. But you gotta let me respond to your question rather than I dropping a bomb and running away. It was my time. So there is a crisis on the border, and, and it's not gonna go away if we keep enticing more and more. If we want to abolish ICE, we want to give away college education and driver's licenses and free medical care and reward illegal behavior. You're never gonna solve the immigration crisis on the border. It's not gonna happen. Right? And look at the guns on this guy. This guy can barely contain his arms inside the suit jacket. This is why Donald Trump enlisted Tom Homan as the MAGA border security guard and the MAGA border security czar. I didn't help him when certain members of Congress criticize the agents down there trying to do their job. Probably doesn't help when you have pictures put on websites that talk about cages when in fact the picture was from the Obama administration. Probably doesn't help when you say the crisis is faked, contrived, and manufactured, and hold off spending the $4.6 billion we needed to actually deal with a crisis that got much worse, probably doesn't help with all those, all those factors either, does it? Probably not, but I think Mr. Jim Jordan here does a phenomenal job highlighting the misinformation and disinformation that is consistently coming out from the left. No, sir. Probably doesn't help that you got cities declaring themselves sanctuaries. That probably doesn't help with the situation either. And it doesn't help to have a missed message that all of a sudden deferred action is going away. That all of a sudden prosecutor discretion is going away for this policy change. I myself have approved many requests for stays of removal for medical issues. ICE doesn't put their heart on a shelf when they wear the badge and gun and all of a sudden they don't care about humanity. It's ridiculous. It's a ridiculous false narrative. And I'm going to be here to the day I die to defend the men and women of the Border Patrol and ICE who put it online every day for this country. Um, a, a quick question that I want to try to... or. or statement and then some clarification. It, it is my observation that um, when DHS rolled this policy change, for lack of a better term, until I get to the second panel to ask uh, USCIS, when they rolled it out, it is my view that it was uh, not rolled out the way it should be rolled out, right? It should have been rolled out a different way. Uh, and we'll see what that looks like in the next panel. If one thought that ICE was the best place to deal with deferred um, action, uh, it would seem to me that the debate then is whether, you know, the question here is where it should be. Should it be USCIS or should it be at ICE? And that we, if we were going to, if you were going to accept that premise, then what should have been done was much clearer notice given and much a different kind of transition. Like let's just assume for a minute ICE is the best place for it. Then a letter should have gone out or a phone call or, you know, reach out and say, hey, no issue. You're going to keep getting health treatment. We're changing processes. This is the way ICE is now going to handle it and so forth and so forth. So I think I'd, I'd like to just stipulate 
that that's my view. That that's that if you're transitioning the way you previously handle something, then you need to have something like that. Uh, we'll ask the second panel about that. Having said that, uh, I do. I am interested in continuing to learn where it should exist. We'll hear from USCIS in a minute, but I want to understand, Mr. Homan, on the, that question. We'll come to this other stuff in a minute. With respect to ICE and why you think it's the best place, can you speak to the question at hand here about, I think, the fear of somebody's here, they're in a tough situation, and you're saying, okay, we're getting shoved into a pipeline for expedited removal, and then hoping there might be a question of discretion. Well, and can you, can you kind of walk through how that might work in ICE? Well, let's be clear in my testimony. What I've said is, as a law enforcement officer, prosecutorial discretion needs to be in the hands of those who have statutory authority over those laws. It is a case-by-case -case determination. Right. Once you carve out a whole class of people you want prosecutorial discretion, it's no longer prosecutorial discretion based right. on a case-by-case. -case. Now, we have talked about states. That's what ICE currently do. They give stage removal. Mr. Marino, what he says, I'm not disagreeing with him. Is ICE prepared to make other decisions that CIS is making? That's a question for ICE in the next panel. Right. What I've talked about is ICE needs to have the authority of prosecutorial discretion, and that's a legal issue. And, and, and I think those decisions, no other agencies to say, well, ICE can't remove that person. That needs to be ICE prosecutorial discretion, or you shouldn't put in proceedings. That needs to be ICE's decision. Now, the, are they So what Mr. Holman is trying to say here is that uh, ICE should have the ability to pick and choose who should be prosecuted and who shouldn't. Now, the uh, subsequent questions that then come into play uh, naturally is, will ICE maintain the authority to decide who gets to remain in the United States and who will be uh, deported off to various other countries outside of the United States? That's the big question. And the question is, is really more of a humanitarian related question. And this is where a lot of people are concerned. Will ICE or whatever particular body of organizational government, uh, which is in charge of deportation, be um, dehumanize this, like the folks who are involved, or will they make humanitarian decisions and say, hey, you know, okay, this family gets to stay here. This family has been working. Uh, the dad has been providing for the family for the last eight years. They're here illegally. Um, but maybe there, there, there will be some uh, exceptions that will allow some folks to be able to stay here in the United States legally. Uh, but this is what is literally up for determination and uh, and is being battled out as we speak right now. Hey, if you haven't already, please take a second, hit the like button for the video. I totally appreciate you guys. You guys are absolutely amazing. They prepare to do that because they normally don't. You have to ask the next panel that. So I, I'm not lying on it to my testimony. I'm speaking to my 30 years of doing this and what I think prosecutorial discretion means. So uh, what, and, and the reason I think this matters, right, is the purpose of, uh, I, I hope there's general agreement about the process and the communication and what should have occurred there, that we can have a debate, as I think we had a good conversation, Ms. Ocasio-Cortez and Mr. Meadows, about, okay, where do we go forward on this, on that question? We'll ask the next panel some of these. But it, but it is important for us not to send some signal of, you know, uh, panic, to use Mr. Meadows' term, that, that anything is going, going to be problematic going forward that will address the issue and try to reconcile whatever gaps there are here. Um, I do think it's also important to note on this question of deferred action, the question of uh, when it is a discretion for a prosecutor, right? This is at the court of DACA and DAPA, right? We had this litigation in DAPA. Uh, we went to the court and the court agreed that that was something more than discretion. That was something beyond discretion. And I think what we see here in a sort of separation here is that what we're talking about here is discretion. I think uh, Ms. Wadi, I was looking at your testimony, uh, the data points there, he said, one data I was able to identify included 118 deferred actions, of which 107 were approved, pending or unknown, and a particular data set that you had, indicating that each one is case by case, and there were eight that didn't qualify. I have no idea what those eight were, but you know that's a decision by you know case by case decision. Um, to that end, let me ask one question final in my last five minutes. Mr. Homan, uh, would you like to address, uh, and would you please address any of the- Yeah, I want to address the last comments made about me being appalling and and, and First of all, I served my country for 34 years. I saved many lives, and I ran an agency. Let's be frank in what ICE does. Oh, boy. I, ICE, last year, took a, a season of op opioids off the streets of this country that could have killed every man, woman, and child 
in the United States twice. They've arrested thousands of sexual predators that, that pre uh, preyed on children. They rescued thousands of children who were, who were victims of, of predators. They arrested hundreds of women who were victims of sex trafficking. I am proud of the agency in ICE. And what we don't want to talk about is nearly 90% of everybody ICE arrests for immigration violations either have a criminal history or are pending criminal charges when they were found. I mean, they were found in a county jail, which most likely means they weren't a choir boy. Wow, unbelievable. But this is this is the kind of information that the left doesn't want to let uh, out to the public. Um, but we're we're putting this on blast, and this is why we, uh, I think this is why a lot of people end up subscribing to our channel, because we put out the information that uh, typically is kind of left hidden um, and is oftentimes never discovered. So. I just want to appreciate the support from you guys. Thank you for hitting the like button and subscribing. Thank you for sharing these videos. You guys are amazing. So to, to miss messages, what the, the work the men and women of ICE do is, I find appalling that a member of Congress would, would withdraw that out there like that. I, it, 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 in my 34 years, I've never seen such hate toward law enforcement agency in my life that you want to abolish them rather than doing your job and legislate. Mr. Holman, your if they don't like expired. it, legislate. You can't. If, I, Mr. I Holman, Congress according to the rules of this committee, of enacting laws. Mr. Holman, your time is expired. Wow. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, also known as AOC, has literally lost it and was advised to grab her gavel and smash the gavel uh, on Mr. Tom Holman's uh, speech. Zero tolerance was interpreted as the policy that separated children from their If family. I get arrested for DUI and I have a young child in a car, I'm going to be separated. When I was a police officer in New York and I arrested a father for domestic violence, I separate that. Mr. Holman, with family. all due respect, legal asylees are not charged with any crime. What? Okay, so AOC is saying that legal asylees are not charged with any crime. Me personally, I don't see anything wrong with that. It's legal. The entire argument, the entire basis here is based on illegal activities. Under the country illegally is violation 8 United States Code 1325. Seeking asylum is legal. If you want to seek asylum, you go to the port of entry, do it the legal way. The Attorney General of the United States has made that clear. Wow. AOC has literally been silenced by Tom Holman. Watch. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, earlier, my colleague from Maryland, Mr. Raskin, asked the panel how many people here believe that child separation is an effective policy in deterrence. And no one on the panel raised their hand. I just wanted to note that for the record, Mr. Chair. I, I wanted to ask a question from Professor um, Mukherjee. Is the United States violating or violated human rights agreements set by the United Nations in a family separation policy? Yes. International law is clear that family unity should be prioritized. So we, as members of the United Nations, signed on into an international human rights agreement saying very clearly that family separation is a violation of international human rights and then we pursued a policy that violates human rights. Um, you know, Mr. Chair, I was looking, how did we get to this point? How did we get to this point where we take children out of mothers and fathers' arms? And, uh, you know, it, it dated back family separation in the way that we have seen it, where we take children away from their parents without due process, began last year under Secretary Kirsten Nielsen, but I had to dig further, and our staff dug further. But where did this start within the administration? She implemented it, and we found a memo. It dates back to April 23rd of 2018. Here is where AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, attempts to assert her competence before the courtroom. Where there was an official recommendation to, quote, pursue prosecution of all amenable adults who cross our border, quote, illegally, even though this applied to legal asylum se seekers in practice, including those presenting with a family unit between ports of entry in coordination with DOJ. Here is the memo that I would like to submit to the congressional record. What is the date on that? It is the memo, memorandum for the secretary um, 
from Homeland Security. Date. April 23rd, 2018, subject increasing prosecutions of immigration violations. Without objection. And so I looked at this memo and it seems like this is the source of it. And it seems as though, Mr. Homan, that you are the author. It says here from yourself, Kevin Michalinen and Francis Cisna. Is this correct? Did you sign the memo? I'd like to see what you yeah, give it a I'd be happy to provide it. I mean, it's like, okay, how can he read it when he's like 100 feet away from her with font size 12? <laughs> Unbelievable. Um, and we'll provide it over, but I would like to note that here it says the official recommendation. There were three different options presented. The third included the option for family separation. This initiative would pursue prosecution of all amenable adults, including those presenting with a family unit. Mr. Homan, your name is on this, is this correct? Yes, I signed that memo. So you are the author of the family separation policy? I am not the author of this memo. You're not the author, but you signed the memo? Yes. A zero you can sign a memo and not be an author of it. A zero tolerance memo. So you provided the official recommendation to Secretary Nielsen on family, for the United States to pursue family separation. I gave Secretary Nielsen numerous recommendations on how to secure the border and save lives. But it says here that you, re you gave her numerous options, but the recommendation was option three, family but, separation. What I'm saying, this is not the only paper where we've given the Secretary numerous options to secure the border and save lives. And so the recommendation of the many that you recommended, you recommended family separation. I recommend a zero tolerance. Which includes family separation. The same as is whenever a U.S. citizen parent gets arrested when they're with a child. You, you see what AOC is trying to do here, right? What AOC here is trying to do is she's trying to make Donald Trump's MAGA border czar, Tom Homan, appear as though he's targeting migrants for family separation. But what Tom Holman is arguing is that this is no different than any other parent, child, legal American citizen being separated from their children. And Tom Holman is specifically using an example that is very common here in the United States. Let's just say you're an American citizen. You're born here. You've got 10 generations of American citizens uh, lineage through you. You've, you've been here forever, right? You're an American citizen. But yet, let's just say you're driving down the road, get pulled over for DUI, you know, uh, you're, you're driving under the influence and you have a child with you, okay? Well, the parent driving who's been identified as driving under the influence will be separated from their child, whether they're a citizen of the United States or an illegal immigrant, either way, uh, you're gonna be separated. AOC is trying to make the argument that Tom Homan is uh, singling out or at least making recommendations to Homeland Security that illegal immigrants should be separated uh, from their children, families should be separated and, and, and parted during apprehension, and it's not the case. This would happen in any situation where there's illegal activity taking place and the culprit or suspect is uh, arrested when there's a child involved. There's always separation. So it's not like this is an isolated uh, situation. This is standard protocol across the board here in the United States. Zero tolerance was interpreted as the policy that separated children from their- If I get arrested for DUI and I have a young child in a car, I'm gonna be separated. When I was a police officer in New York and I arrested a father for domestic violence, I separate that Mr. father Mr. Homer, with all due respect, legal asylees are not charged with any crime. When you're This is the very basis of the argument. He's talking about illegal uh, immigrants entering the country, not people who are doing things legally. If they're here legally, then there would be no family separation. And this is the very argument that Tom Homan is making, but this is the point that AOC's thick skull is unable to, uh, to receive. Legal asylees are not charged with any crime. 
When you enter the country illegally, it's violation of 8 United States Code 1325. Seeking asylum is legal. If you want to seek asylum, you go through the port of entry, do it the legal way. Boom. The Attorney General of the United States has made that clear. Okay. Boom. Boom. AOC is done. AOC just got roasted in front of the entire panel. Former President-elect and former President and Donald, congratulations. And uh, looking forward to having, a, like we said, a smooth transition. Do everything we can to make sure you're accommodated, what you need. And we're going to get a chance to talk about some of that today. It's a good welcome. Welcome, Thank you, much. And, uh, thank you very much. And uh, politics is tough. And it's, uh, in many cases, not a very nice world, but it is a nice world today, and I appreciate it very much. And a transition that's so smooth, it'll be as smooth as it can get, and uh, I very much appreciate it. Wow. So, President Trump, or I should say President-elect Donald Trump, I have to get used to not saying former President Donald Trump anymore, uh, meets with President Biden at the White House. And we're being uh, promised that there's, this will be a smooth transition of power. Uh, President-elect Trump has already selected multiple members for his cabinet, including new border czar Tom Homan. But what we are witnessing here today, guys, on November 13th, 2024, is Donald Trump and President Joe Biden shaking hands in the White House during this, uh, let's just call it the intermission between uh, presidential successors. Watch. You're welcome. Thank you all. First, the latest on President-elect Trump. He left Mar-a-Lago moments ago. You see it right there as he heads to the White House this morning to meet with President Biden, then to Capitol Hill. He's also announced nominees for top positions in his administration, including Defense Secretary and CIA Director, also a role for Elon Musk. Rachel Scott starts us off on Capitol Hill. Good morning, Rachel. George, good morning to you. President-elect Donald Trump won this election just a week ago, but he is already moving at a rapid pace to fill out his administration, announcing 14 appointments already, nine alone yesterday. But it's his pick for Secretary of Defense that caught even some Republicans here on Capitol Hill by surprise. Overnight, President-elect Donald Trump stacking his administration with staunch loyalists, announcing a string of appointments. Trump revealing he has selected Fox and Friends weekend host Pete Hegseth for defense secretary. The pick even catching some Republicans off guard. The U.S. Army veteran who has led two conservative veterans groups would oversee the Pentagon and 1.3 million active duty troops. Hegseth just days ago said he doesn't believe women should be in combat roles. I'm straight up just saying we should not have women in combat roles. It hasn't made us more effective, hasn't made us more lethal, has made fighting more complicated. He has no government experience, but has been a staunch Trump loyalist. Hegseth called on Trump to clean house at the Pentagon. Black you know, the same argument could be made for Donald Trump. Donald Trump didn't have any uh, political background. He didn't. He was never a politician, but yet he was an amazing president previously. So uh, does it mean that because you have no previous political background that you can't be do well at your job? It's almost like any role that anyone has ever been hired for at some point in time. Uh, any person who's in a role had no experience. There's no person who was born with experience. So you have to get it from somewhere. And again, Donald Trump is a great example of a politician who came in at the highest level of uh, office, the highest level in the land, the president of the United States. And uh, he, he did a phenomenal job, I think. Blasting its message of diversity as strength as quote, garbage. The Pentagon likes to say, our diversity is our strength. What a bunch of garbage. In the military, our diversity is not our strength. Our unity is our strength. It was just one of many positions Trump named overnight. One of his biggest supporters, billionaire Elon Musk, will lead a new Department of Government Efficiency alongside entrepreneur Vivek Ramaswamy. Take over, Elon, yes, take over. Wow. Despite the name, the Department of Government Efficiency doesn't currently exist. Trump. Wow. It might not necessarily exist. The Department of, of Government Efficiency might not necessarily exist. But in my opinion, this is one branch of government that definitely needs to be added. How many millions, trillions of dollars get wasted every single year putting Americans further and further into debt as a result of a lack of government constraint, a lack of control over the government purse strings? I mean, it's just unbelievable how much waste takes place every single year. I mean, the, the, the government, the United States 
national debt just continues to tick forward billions of dollars increase putting us further and further in the hole at increasing interest rates every single year it's like our kids our grandkids our great 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 grandkids will forever be paying off this national debt if someone doesn't step in to address this and i think that when you look at what elon musk has done with tesla when you look at what elon musk has done with uh spacex and um just just look at what elon musk has done with twitter now known as x what elon musk tends to like to do and what we've observed uh, with many of Elon Musk's uh, organizations that he runs. And it's amazing how many multi-billion dollar corporations Elon Musk runs successfully at the same freaking time is unreal. But one of the strategies that Elon Musk tends to do and what he's done in the past is what he'll do is he'll remove many different components to a uh, product or a system to see at which point does the system break okay and what this does is this strategy allows elon musk to figure out what components are actually necessary and what components are not necessarily and they're just they're just adding to the complexity of something and 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 adding to the cost and then once you identify what those useless components are then you remove them and i think this is exactly what we need here in the united states government we need to identify what are the useless components to government and remove them. Trump says it will provide advice and guidance from outside of government, but there are still questions about how exactly it would operate or be funded. Musk pitched the idea directly to Trump earlier this year. I think it would be great to just have a government efficiency commission that takes a look at, uh, at, at these things and and just ensures that the taxpayer money, the, the taxpayer's hard-earned money is spent in a good way. I mean, who could argue um, and and it, it tends to be the left because the, le the left has a tendency and a reputation for just squandering money at, at a ridiculous rate, at a ridiculous clip. But who could argue having a government oversight committee or branch of government or however you want to label it, whose sole responsibility is to literally say, hey, you know, we just want to go over uh, the balance sheets and make sure that the money being spent is is uh, is efficient. I mean, look no further than Kamala Harris' most recent campaign. Kamala Harris raised a billion dollars for her campaign, yet she somehow overspent a billion dollars by like thirty million dollars and still lost the campaign. So not only was her uh, her her spending inefficient but it also did not accomplish their goal. When you look at Donald Trump's campaign, he only raised a fraction of what they raised and then had money left over. Donald Trump's campaign only raised around $354 million. They ended up having 20 to $30 million remaining after, well, after the election ended and they won just triumphantly. It wasn't even a close race. He blew her out of the water. I think he, he, he beat her by like almost 100 electoral votes, beat her in the popular votes, won Arizona, won Pennsylvania, every one of the swing states with a fraction of the budget. So um, it definitely and, and again, Donald Trump is not a career politician. Here you have another example of a politician who decided who who the American people decided should run the country with business acumen and without a political background and pulled it off successfully. Um, and and, and I'd, I'd be happy to help out on such a commission. I'd if, love if it. If it were fun. Musk has poured more than $100 million into helping Trump's campaign. And sources tell ABC News he has been at Mar-a-Lago nearly every day since Trump was elected, listening in on calls with foreign leaders and weighing in on staffing decisions. Musk even traveling with the president-elect this morning to Washington, D.C., ahead of Trump's meeting at the White House with President Biden. And as Trump promises to overhaul U.S. intelligence agencies, the president-elect announcing John Ratcliffe, his former director of national intelligence, who served as a fierce loyalist in Congress, will serve as CIA director. Wow, these are some big moves, guys. These are some huge moves. Uh, comment down below, what do you guys think about Donald Trump's most recent picks? Also, what do you think about Donald Trump selecting Elon Musk to be the uh, government uh, spending oversight uh, 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 party member, so to speak? Let me know in the comments, guys.
And South Dakota Governor Kristi Noem will lead the Department of Homeland Security. Let's send President Trump back to the White House. Trump once considered Noem a potential running mate, but she fell off the shortlist after writing in her memoir that she had shot and killed the family dog. If confirmed, Noem would manage the Secret Service, the Coast Guard, and FEMA, along with immigration agencies like Border Patrol and ICE. Wow, this is big news, guys. This is huge. And let's not forget about Tom Homan. Tom Homan was recently selected as Donald Trump's newest border czar. Working hand-in-hand -hand with Trump's border czar, Tom Homan, to implement Trump's mass deportations. It is going to be a, a big operation, and President Trump has already indicated that he wants to start by making sure that we're deporting the most dangerous first. And wow, guys. Hey, if you haven't already, please take a second, hit the like button for the video. I totally appreciate you guys. You guys are absolutely amazing. Uh, don't forget to check out my previous videos, and I'll see you guys on the next one. Well, guys, the great wealth transfer is in full effect, and you know, whether it's Donald Trump that ends up winning the election, or if it's Kamala Harris, oh God, we're in a... We're in, a, we're in a world of a pickle, as my grandfather would say. Our freedoms are being stolen, guys. Credit card companies are out to get us. And if you don't understand the game, well, you end up getting played by the game. Now, if you're anything like me, guys, you know, you were uh, probably out of shape, maybe in debt, uh, living paycheck to paycheck, and just feeling like the system was just completely taking advantage of you. I remember for a long time, I could rarely ever get any time to spend with my wife. And it's kind of funny because uh, where I used to work, I used to work with a lot of married men. And a lot of those married men would always complain about their spouses as if they really just didn't even like their spouses, which is sounding like a pretty horrible situation. But that was the case for many of them. They didn't like, the, they didn't like who they were married to, but I was different. Anyway, through trial and error and through a lot of pain, I figured out how to gain freedom and also lose a lot of weight and actually get in shape. And guys, I'm gonna be honest with you, that was a game changer. To no longer be living paycheck to paycheck, figuring out how to get the credit cards to pay me, the power of a strong credit score. I pay thousands of dollars less per year for the same house as my neighbor, just because my credit is better than his is. And this is not to brag. I mean, but this is the truth. The banks are literally taking advantage of the poor. It's like the people who can least afford it, they're charging the poor what is like unofficially called a poor tax or a tax on the poor. I mean, I'm now at a point where, you know, like, Number one, I don't pay for credit cards. In fact, credit card companies pay me to use their cards. And I figured out how to build a lifestyle that is just ultimately very, very healthy. I lost a tremendous amount of weight and I put on a lot of muscle. But when I was struggling, I wish I knew people who knew these things. So anyway, I decided to create a community of like-minded people who are also interested just like me in living better. So if you guys wanna join my community, it's called the Liberty Pursuit Network. It is brand new. Come on over, I'd love to have you guys and join like like-minded people be positively motivated by others who are also on the same pursuit so i'm going to leave a link for you guys so you can join me over on the life pursuit network in the description down below this video so check it out guys and let's not be a victim of this great wealth transfer that is taking place right now